Hi everyone, it's Plastic EP coming in from Melbourne, Australia to Across the Universe and I want to tell you, this is going to be a very great interview because we have the fantastic Larry Geller, right, Elvis's hairdresser, he was hairdresser to the stars, he worked for Jay Sebring, the man is a legend in his own time but what I want to say is to Elvis fans, I think after the Baz Luhrmann movie now we've got a Elvis, I actually think Larry's story would make a fascinating movie. Would you agree with that, Larry? 100%, Plastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially after seeing the movie. Uh, and I'm very glad the movie came out. I am thrilled it came out. Why? Because it turned so many people around the world onto Elvis, had no idea about him. Now they know. Uh, the movie itself um, was it was a, it's a biopic, so they had to create a lot of scenes and which never uh, ever happened. But an authentic movie, that's something that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Now, Larry, I want to say, and I mean this sincerely, right? Elvis fans have to appreciate the the fact that you loved Elvis so much and you cared for the man so much. But what I want to say is you played a big part in his life because not only was he a big influence on you, but you were a big influence on Elvis. And I think you were one of the biggest influences on him because like Steve Binder, who stood up to the Colonel, you stood up to the Colonel and you loved the man so much that you weren't afraid of anything and you always cared for him. You were there with him most of his life, being his personal hairdresser from 1964. You were there for 11 movies. You spent nearly two hours of the day doing his hair. And I mean, I've got to say something. Anybody that gets their hair cut from a hairdresser always has private conversations about their life because they have to talk to somebody. And you are that particular person. And there's no right. one else in the world that knows more about all of us, I'm honest, then yourself with these private conversations. Am I not right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I grew up in Hollywood. And in the 50s, growing up in that town was very, very exciting for a lot of reasons. One day in 1956, that's the year Elvis came on the scene. That's when everyone found out his music, and he existed. He, and the first song that I heard was Heartbreak Hotel. That was his first, that was his breakthrough record. And then the rest of them came, one right after another. It was unbelievable. In that same year of 1956, when he had all these hits, Hound Dog, I Want You, I Need Your Love, all, shook, all of them, he started in his own movie. So not only did he become immediately the king of rock and roll, but he was a major movie star. So I became a fan just like you overnight. I knew every song, every lyric, every move that he made. I, I, I bought a guitar and on the weekends went to parties, I would imitate Elvis. That's how much of a fan I was. Then in 1957, we heard that Elvis is coming to town, to West Hollywood. Now in those days, there were just no rock concerts, did not exist. And my buddies and I, we were naive and yet we were passionate because we wanted to meet Elvis more than anything. So we go to the auditorium, the Pan Pacific, and there's thousands of kids coming in from all directions. We never saw this before. You know, we take rock concerts for granted, but when it didn't exist, and you go to the first one in Hollywood of all places, the entertainment capital of the world, it was astounding. And we were so naive, plastic. We thought someone was going to invite us and said, oh, come and sit with us. 
We didn't even realize you needed tickets. This is how new this phenomenon was. So before we knew it, most of the people went inside and it was a very famous uh, venue for the auto show or the ice capades, uh, things of that sort. But this was the perfect place for Elvis. So we looked at one another, what are we gonna do? We have to meet this man. So we ran to the side of the building and we tried to yank a, a, a door open, didn't work. We didn't know what to do. So we went to the back side of the building and all of a sudden I said, look, look, there's Elvis. He was standing about 10, 10 yards away. And I looked at my buddies and they were like frozen. I realized that they were frightened. They were frightened to go up to meet him. And I said, well, I'm going. And I ran up to Elvis. And at that time, I was pretty short. Elvis stood just under six feet, a big sized man. And I ran up to him and he looked at me. And when I ran right in front of him, I looked up at him. And I was like, I couldn't, it, it, he didn't even look like a real person. You know, the sideburns, the eyes, that look. And I looked at him and he saw that I was nervous. And he said, hi, I'm Elvis Presley. And I said, hi, Elvis, hi. I'm, my name is Larry Geller, it's so great to meet you. And the minute I said it, one of the guys with him said, Elvis, you're on now, man. They want you, come on, come on, you're on, come on. And Elvis was very nonchalant. He looked at me, he said, well, you heard what they said, kid, talk to you some other time. And he walked off. And I stood there in the zone, the Elvis zone. And all of a sudden I realized people are coming up to me, shaking my hand, strangers. Some girl put her arm around me and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is something else. That was my first taste of Elvis. And the interesting thing, Plastic, is this. When he said to me, talk to you some other time, kid, I believed him. I believed him. <laughs> I didn't give it much thought afterwards. I didn't think, oh, I, he, we're going to talk again. But at that moment, I believed that I would talk to him again. Okay. I graduate high school. I enter college. And I was only taking, I was going two days a week. I was floundering. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And my best friend, Christian, comes up to me and he said, Larry, you're only taking three units in college. You better get serious with your life. What do you want to be? What do you want to become? I said, I don't know. You know, my dad was in show business. He traveled in vaudeville with the Marx Brothers and Al Josen and Jack Benny and all those and I wanted to be in show business. He said, well, that's great, but you need to fall back on something. You need a trade, an occupation. He said, why don't you, you know, you're very artistic. Why don't you think about becoming a hairstylist? You get a job in Beverly Hills and you, all the women will, a lot of women will, you'll meet. And I thought about it, I said, yeah, that's a very good idea. I dropped out of college. I entered beauty college. I went through the course. I took the state board examination and I'm waiting for my, the results. So one afternoon I'm walking in, in Hollywood and I see this big stained glass window with a weird kind of a symbol. I didn't know what it was. So I figured, oh, go in. So I went inside. I looked around, it looked like a, a beauty salon or a barber shop. I wasn't sure. Uh, a lot of wood panels, uh, hanging plants, a jazz in the background. And I saw this guy on a little stool hanging up a, a plant. And I said, what is this place? He said, well, my name is Jay Sebring. And I'm going to open this week the very first salon for men in America. It didn't exist plastic in those days. Men went to barber shops for a dollar, a dollar. He said, I'm gonna charge $10 and I'm gonna, we're gonna shampoo the hair 
and we're going to do something never done. This is an experiment. What do you do? And I told him, I'm waiting for my license. I have a job in Beverly Hills to do women's theory. He said, hey, what? Don't do it. Join forces with me. We are going to be innovators, pioneers in a new industry. And all men is going to have their hair done in the future. He, it sounded right to me. And I said, absolutely. We opened our doors that week. Plastic, I'm telling you, immediately our clientele read like a Hollywood's who's who. The word got out. Sinatra, Brand, Marlon Brando, Steve McQueen, Paul Newman, Rock Hudson, Roy Orbison, Glenn Campbell, name the star in motion pictures, TV, the Everly Brothers. Every, I was doing Sam Cooke's hair, Peter Sellers hair, uh, Roy, I was doing Roy Orbison's hair. It was unbelievable. And I was only, when we opened, I was 19 years old. So over the next couple of years, we were it. And all the major movies and TV shows of the 60s is our work. We did all that. James Gardner, all these incredible stars. Rod Serling from, from uh, Twilight Zone. It was wonderful. One afternoon, I'm doing someone's hair. And my phone rang and I picked, hello. And I heard the southern draw, drawl on the other side of the line. And the voice said, uh, Larry, um, I'm sitting here with Elvis Presley. And I mean, I heard that name. Because the truth is, Elvis was the celebrity of celebrities. And even more so now. So when I heard and remembering eight years ago, eight years ago, and so he, uh, Alan said to me, I'm sitting with Elvis, he heard about your work. He wants to know if you'd like to come up to the house here in Bel Air to fix his hair. I said, I'd love to. He gave me you know, the directions of where to go. I packed my bag up. I'm running out the door of the salon and the receptionist, she says to me, Larry, Larry, Peter Sellers is on the phone. He wants you now. I said, tell Peter I'll call him later. I didn't care who it was. Could have been the president of the United States. Didn't matter. Moses. I drive up to Elvis's house. And I knew the street right away because there were tons of fans everywhere. Young, old, how many? I don't know, a lot. Wherever Elvis was, the fans are outside his house. Right now, as you and I are talking, they're there right now at Graceland. It has not stopped and it won't. So I go in the house, I'm looking around and right away I turn my head and the kitchen, there was a table with a bunch of guys in Elvis. He was wearing a baseball cap, like the one Marlon Brando wore in The Wild One. I don't know if you recall that. And he was wearing this cap. And Elvis said, be right with you, man. So someone took me to the other room, the, the living room. And about 30 seconds later, here comes Elvis. And I'm looking at him, and he had that same beauty, that same inner glow, that energy that just was shooting off of him like fireworks. He walks up to me, he says, oh, I am Elvis Presley. No, I'm, I'm standing a little taller than him. I'm 6'2". I'm looking down, I'm having a flashback of the skinny kid. Hi, Elvis. <laughs> I'm saying, Elvis, great to meet you. He says, come on, let's go in my bathroom. You fix my hair, we'll talk. I said, beautiful. We go in the bathroom and I'm looking around. There's a big bathroom, very lovely. And a little basin, you know, uh, to put to uh, where I can put his head down and shampoo his hair. 
and I'm shampooing his hair and I'm being very, very careful. And I'm, I'm cupping it, the water in my hands and I'm, so he doesn't get wet or anything. And all of a sudden he picks his head up and starts shaking his head and water is splattering, is hitting me. He's drenched. And he looks at me and he said, hey man, what the hell? The lease is clean. And when he said that, it put me at ease a little bit because he was so real. He was so natural. There are a lot of celebrities. How can I put this delicately? That have an armor. They have filters. They want you to know who they are. I could, I could have been a senator, a politician. I could have been a gardener. It didn't matter. Elvis treated everyone like a human being. And I, I recognized that in that very moment, which is good for me because now I have to do his hair. Now comes the real part. He sits down in front of a long mirror, marble edge. He's telling me he's in the middle of a movie called Rostabout. And he said, Larry, you know, you can't cut too much off because the scenes have to match. I said, Elvis, believe me, I know. Just leave it to me. He said, okay, man, I'm leaving the driving to you. I proceed to do his hair. Took me about 35, 40 minutes, and not a word was spoken. And, I'm, and as I'm doing this here, I'm looking in the mirror and I can see him following every move I make. He was very focused. And I, I knew if he, if he wanted to engage in a conversation, I'm available. But he didn't. So I figured, all right, I'll do my work because I, I want this to be right. I spritz his hair. I'm saying, what do you think, Elvis? And I'm looking in the mirror. He said, ah, oh, beautiful, beautiful. And he spins around in the chair. And he pokes his finger right in, like this. Who are you, Larry? What are you really all about, man? What are you really into? Whoa. I was, I was shocked. That's a very heavy thing to say. We never really spoke until that moment when he said, who are you? And I'm thinking to myself, what the, what is going on? This, I'm in Elvis Presley's bathroom. I just did his hair and he says this to me. So I said, well, Elvis, look, you, you know what I do for a living. And I have a beautiful clientele, some celebrities. I'll go to the studio. Sometimes they bring me into Vegas. I love my work. It's a nice living. But I, I hear what you're asking me. What's more important to me than my work and my career is my search for truth, for God, for the reason for being alive. Why are we here, Elvis? How did this happen? How did everything get here? Or did it happen like the scientists want us to believe? There was a bunch of chemicals and an explosion and over billions and billions and billions of years, everything evolved to us? Or is there a God? Is there an intelligence? Is there a higher power? Is there something behind all this? And I said, Elvis, look, I read a lot of books, Eastern, Western, modern, ancient, I don't care. I want to learn and I'm studying every day. And I became a meditator. I'm a vegetarian and, I, I, and plastic. I have to mention this. We have to recognize that time period. That was 1964. People did not talk about these subjects then. No way. Today, turn on the te television and, you know, we're, there's yoga studios in every block now. I mean, spirit, the spiritual awakening, we're in one right, right now today, but not back then. It was just starting. 
we were on the cusp of the major changes in the 60s. At um, any rate, I, I told them this and I started to get very self-conscious. And I said to him, look, Elvis, wait a minute. I, I, know, I know who you are. You're the biggest star on planet Earth. This has got to sound corny to you. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, man. Larry, you have no idea how much I need to hear what you have to say. Keep on talking. Plastic, we got into a conversation that lasted about two hours. Meaning I was there for the whole period that day for three hours. But now we got into a conversation and Elvis said to me, you know, Larry, I have questions just like you, because what you're telling me is what I secretly think about every night, especially when I'm going to bed. He said, I have no one to talk to about this. The guys, my guys, they, they're not interested in anything like this. Why, he said, why was I, and it went like this. Why was I plucked out of all the millions and millions of lives to become Elvis? Why me? Why me? He said, Larry, do you know that I have a twin brother? I do, Elvis. I said, yeah. I have twin sisters. They're major fans, and they told me all about your life. And he said, he was stillborn. My brother, Jesse Guerin, was stillborn. What would have happened if I didn't make it and he did? Would you be doing this here right now? What if he would have made it? Would we be the Presley brothers? Is, so this conversation started to get real. And he had tears in his eyes. And he started telling me about his, his early, early life. He told me about when he was born. He said, people don't, you know, I have a lot of fans, Larry. A lot of them don't even really know where I, how it was for my family when I was born. I was born in a shack, a wooden shack of two rooms that my daddy built with his own hands, with nails and a hammer. That was it. And he built it. He said, uh, you want to turn the light on? <laughs> we had no electricity. No electricity whatsoever. Oh, you want you want some water? Get that pail and go outside to the well. Oh, you have to go to the bathroom? You have to pee? Outside to the outhouse. We had nothing, Larry. Nothing. My life is a fantasy. It was like overnight I come on the scene and become Elvis Presley. So we got into a lot of things. It went on for several hours, like I told you. And all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, Peter Sellers is waiting for me. I got my life out there. And I looked at him I said, Elvis, uh, Peter Sellers is waiting for me. He said, Peter Sellers, he is my number one favorite of all time. This guy is a genius because Dr. Strangelove, that movie, came out about six months prior to this. And Elvis all of a sudden started to imitate Dr. Strangelove and did a couple of bits and put his hand out and went like, like uh, and then he said, Larry, let me tell you something. I've got a real good idea. Go back and you tell Jay Sebring that you're not gonna work for him anymore. And you're not gonna work for any of these celebrities, that you're gonna be working for Elvis Presley. What do you think? <laughs> I didn't have to use my brain. What should I think about? <laughs> this is Elvis. But here's the deal. He said to me, and I said, yes. And he said to me right after that, he said, meet me tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, Paramount Studios, and bring some of the books you're telling me about. He didn't tell me to bring my brush and my hair spray, all that, bring books, right? Yeah. Larry, I want to ask you quickly about Elvis meeting the Beatles. And I know this was a big event, but I also want to ask you, there was no photos or videos taken of Elvis jamming with the Beatles. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought it up 
because it was it's a monumental historical event meeting. It was 1965, August. The Beatles come to town to do their famous Hollywood Bowl concert. And they've been trying to meet Elvis for the last two years. And Elvis always turned it down. Uh, and finally, a meeting was set up through Colonel Parker and Brian Epstein, their manager. Colonel Parker, obviously, Elvis's manager. So it was a Friday night. We just wrapped our movie called Paradise Hawaiian Style that was made at Paramount Studios. And Hawaii, we were on location there. And uh, anyway, uh, that night, I drove up to the house and I was about a half a mile away and there were just fans lining the streets. How many? I, I Thousands and thousands. Police cars, media, people climbing trees. The gates open up, the police let me in. I go in and right away Elvis and I go into his bathroom and I proceed to do his hair. Every day for many years, Elvis and I were alone as I'm doing this hair, and we would always get into a major conversation. So I'm talking one to two to three hours a day for many, many years. So you can imagine what we explored and spoke about, everything under the sun. But this night, Elvis was wearing this beautiful bolero blue shirt. And I'm doing his hair and he's staring, he's just staring. He was very pensive, very withdrawn. And I knew what it was. I knew what it was. And all of a sudden he went like this, he goes, man, I know where those guys are coming from. I know where they're at. I've been there and I've done it. What the, what the hell am I doing with my life and my career, man? What am I doing? I'm making these asinine, stupid, teeny bopper movies that don't mean a thing. It's the same old flick. Every movie is the same that I did the one before, and now the next one will be one that I, I'm doing now. All they do is change my name and change the sets. He said, man, these guys are out there. They're live in front of an audience. That's where the energy is. That's where the love is. That's where reality is. That's where spontaneity is. I'm embarrassed to meet these guys. Why? Because they're coming to meet Elvis Presley and I'm doing this crap and they're doing what they're doing. He says, man, I'm not in this only for the money. I'm an artist. I owe it to myself. I owe it to my fans. Don't get me wrong. I'm making money off of every movie, but they're packaging me. They're coming, every time I do a movie, an album comes out. Millions and millions and millions of dollars are being made from people I don't even know. They feed me this kind of, these songs I really don't want to sing. It's not my real music. But I'm gonna go out there tonight and I'm gonna meet these guys. And I keep telling Colonel Parker, get me a real movie. I'm an actor. I'm an actor. So to kind of wrap this up, and there's more to it, but to wrap this up, we go in the other room. About 10 minutes later, we heard an explosion of noise. The, the Beatles come in, led by Brian Epstein, the four of them, and about three other of their guys. I remember Mal and these two other guys. And everyone shakes hands, hello, hello, hello. Elvis sits down in the chair. The four Beatles, John, Paul, George, and uh, Ringo, sit on the floor right in front of Elvis, cross-legged, uh, half lotus, like this, looking at Elvis. They all, all their jaws were open, down and they didn't know what to say. Elvis was a magnificent, no one looks like Elvis, no one. And I've been with, 
I've been, look, I was been with Paul Newman and Rock Hudson and Warren Beatty and all these fantastic, the best looking guys in the world. Elvis helped eclipse them all. Larry, I've got to say something, I'm being honest. Elvis Presley, the greatest looking human being, male, the greatest voice that ever was. I'm sorry, I don't compare him to the Beatles. It's a harder doing an individual gig, being Elvis as one person and not being with a group of another three, like four people. There's no one competes with Elvis on any level. I don't care, but, you know, I'm not going to say the Beatles looked like Elvis because I'm sorry they didn't. This man was like a creature out of somewhere came from nowhere, the most elegant-looking, beautiful male that ever existed with a voice that's the greatest voice. No one can beat his voice that lasted with him all his life. Now, Larry, I want to thank you so much for the interview. But not only that, I want you to tell everybody out there where they can get your fabulous books. Well, I've written two books. Uh, they're used on Amazon, If I Can Dream. And my last book, Leaves of Elvis's Garden. But they might have some used copies, but they do have it on Kindle, on Amazon. So, uh, I just want to say it's a pleasure meeting you. And we're going to meet again. Of I course, now, Larry, I want to thank you so much. And I want you to know that the world out there loves you. That Larry Geller was a big part of the Elvis story. And you're never going to be forgotten. And what you did while you were with him plays a very important role. And I really sincerely hope that they do a Larry Geller movie because I think it's going to be right up there for somebody that really knew Elvis. And that's what really matters. Plus, you loved him that much. You're just a great human being. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Plasek. I, thank you. Until next time.